Hello, everyone. We are about to be getting started with our communication webinar. Those of you that are joining on the phone, um, I can send you handouts at the end um, so that you can have those. And those handouts are also available to anyone else um, who would like handouts after the presentation. Um, you are all muted, so we'll be using the chat for um, any answering of any questions or asking questions. We will allow questions at the end, and we'll make sure that we have some time for questions at the end, so please feel free. Um, if for some reason you don't get your questions answered, um, then you can um, email me. And my email address will be on the end screen, and I'll say it a couple of times too. Your uh, invitations for this event probably came from my email address as well, rachel at alaskachd.org. Um, if you would like the handout um, after the webinar, you can email me and I can send you the handout at that time. Um, and we will have a couple of polls. So I'm actually going to get that started. If you're attending on a computer or iPad, um, you should be able to see a poll um, occurring, let's see, right now, just to tell us a little bit about who you are, what your relationship is to individuals with autism. Um, are you a parent or caregiver of an individual with autism? Are you a direct support provider who works with individuals with autism? Are you a case manager? So you um, assist uh, families to get the services they need. Um, are you some sort of specialist, an SLP, OT, PT, BCBA, some other um, uh, acronym that I don't have listed there um, that works directly with learners? Um, or are you a self-advocate? Or other, because you know I'm not ever gonna. I'm not always gonna think of all of the categories. Um, but just let us know a little bit about you. Um, I'm seeing about almost everybody. Sixty-three percent of people have um, uh, submitted their answer. So it looks like we have a few parent caregivers, a few direct support providers, um, a case manager, a couple of specialists and a couple of others. So we have a wide variety of people attending today. Um, we will uh, try and um, tailor as far as the examples that we give towards um, a variety of different contexts. Um, but at the end, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and ask us. All right, so I'm going to end that poll. We'll do another one partway through. Thank you all for participating. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. Today's presentation is communication, and this is the third of four webinars in our 2018 Autism Institute Community Sessions series. Um, my name is Rachel White. I will be one of your presenters, and Summer LaFay is our other presenter today. Summer, can you wave? There we go. There's Summer. Um, so we're going to get started in just a minute. Um, just to go over a couple of things again, um, if you have questions, we are going to have take questions at the end. Um, we are recording this event, and our goal is to be able to host these and share them with the community um, at some point in time in the future, hopefully uh, very soon, but we've got to work on the technology first to make sure that we have a good platform to share those. Um, and I will email everyone who signed up for any of the webinars once we are able to make those available so that you can find them and review the videos at that time. Um, we will put, um, be asking a few questions throughout the webinar, and you can use the chat to answer those questions. And like I said, we'll do another poll here um, partway through. Um, and I think, let's see, everyone will remain muted. You don't need to have your camera on. 
I think that about covers it. So at this point, I would like to turn things over to Summer. Um, if I can unmute, there you go. Hi, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Summer LaFay. I work for the Center for Human Development at the University of Anchorage, Alaska. Um, as if you have um, the handouts for today, um, you'll know that I'm a behavior analyst and a clinical social worker. Uh, it's my pleasure today to just talk a little bit, um, an overview about communication as it relates to the Autism Institute for the Center for Human Development. So um, we're gonna move forward and start right off and get going. I'm gonna have to move a few things out of the way so I can even see my own screen. Um, so behavior as communication. So we all know that human beings communicate um, from a very early age. And one of, the, one of the ways that we get our needs met, met is through behavior. And all behavior is communication. Um, we have something that we talk about. If it's not, if, if, a, if a dead person can do it, it's not behavior. But all the rest of behavior is communication. And all behavior happens for a reason. And that's really fundamental in discussing communication as it relates to learners with autism. Um, and as we, as we progress, we're going to talk a little bit about aberrant behavior or challenging behavior as they relate, as it relates to communication. But it's really important to remember that behavior is a form of communication. And think about your own behavior today. Think about, uh, the behaviors that you exhibit that are nonverbal, that are communicative. Think about the behaviors that you exhibit every day that are verbal that communicate in relation to getting what you need, getting away from something you don't like, um, getting access to a thing that you want, or just because it kind of feels good. So those are kind of the four functions of, of behavior, but they're also the four functions often of communication. So here we're going to move forward. I want to just, can you go back once, Rachel? I meant forward kind of in my discussion. <laughs> um, I think it's really important that we, we say on bullet point number three, we're talking about we engage in behaviors to get what we want. It's really important. Folks, think of this in context again of what I just said, what we want, what we don't want, and what we want to get access to could be different between a tangible thing or attention. So that's really important. Problem behaviors are generally behaviors that have evolved as a way to get something or get away from something. And sometimes they evolve because they feel good, but that's kind of a lesser concern for today. The important thing about understanding about problem behaviors as related to communication is that sometimes problem behaviors are a lot faster for learners that have a developmental disability or are um, developing slowly in their communication skills or maybe have some sort of physical disability that impairs speech or as is the subject matter for this entire webinar series, experience autism. So sometimes challenging behaviors develop or problem behaviors develop as a form of communication. And they're a lot faster than learning what most human beings do to communicate, which is, is speak. Most problem behaviors, a good example um, Rachel has on the slide is an infant crying. That's a really good example. Another example you might consider that I come across pretty frequently is aggression. And that might be directed towards another person or aggression in the form of self-injury. And it, it may have a different function in a different, in a different context. But for example, um, a child who hits himself and accesses attention, that's a very quick way to access attention. 
a child who hits himself and a request at school is removed. That's a very quick way to communicate. I don't like that. I don't want to do that. So now you can move forward, Rachel. Thank you. So uh, as an example, here we have, sorry, I'm trying to keep my notes straight. When problems develop, when problem behavior or challenging behaviors develop as a form of communication, it is sometimes, like I said, easier or faster for the learner to communicate their needs that way. So a lot of the time we're working to develop communication systems or alternate communication systems or to build the ability to communicate in learners in order to reduce inappropriate behavior and teach communication. Um, it gives the learner a way to be understood. It allows the caregiver, caregivers to problem solve, to help um, the learner get their needs met. Um, a good example of that, trying to think through what a really good example of that would be. But I think that the number one thing when I think about inappropriate behavior and communication I think that often inappropriate behavior in addition to communicating might make the learner less likely to come in contact with social interactions. So in other words, if instead of being able to speak or select um, to communicate, a learner hits themselves or makes a very loud sound, um, other social interaction is diminished because the people around the learner are less likely to try to engage and interact with them. Now caregivers are always trying to engage and interact, but as we teach appropriate alternate behaviors, we come up with a process for developing and teaching communication that allows the learner to reduce the inappropriate behavior and replace it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the types of um, alternative communication systems that developed in order to help us replace um, inappropriate behavior um, that is serving as, as communication. Um, and as you see on the, the second bullet point on the slide, the most common way we communicate as human beings is using spoken word. And spoken words may be very, very challenging depending on the circumstance or the, the disability experienced by the learner. So there are other things that have evolved over time, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. You can move forward, Rachel. So here we have um, a really um, large overview of alternative methods of speaking and alternative methods of communicating. And I just wanna say a couple of things about this, um, that some, some speech is topographical, which means, it basically means you can see it or you can hear it. It has a shape, topography, it has a topography. And the top um, section of the slide talks about topographical ways or ways of responding or speaking. And when I think of topography, I think of sign language. Um, I also think of verbal speech. Um, I think of Adapted sign, um, I've seen some learners using kind of a, an adaptive form of signs. You can write words, that's also topographical. Um, and you can also say approximations of words as you'll look at the alternative methods of speaking. But topographical means it has a shape and a form. It also means it's very fast, um, it's faster. Now, another alternative method is selection-based forms and this may be something, a card, a picture, um, a sign that you're scanning, you're looking at, and then pointing to. And often, if topography is difficult for a learner at the beginning, we may start, or at all, we may start with a selection-based system. So a selection-based system um, where the learner is working on maybe orienting, orienting their body, their eyes, and selecting a picture of an item or an activity or perhaps um, a caregiver. Um, it could be any, any sort of thing. Um, it takes more. Uh, it takes more time and more understanding from the caregiver to do that. Than, and it's not as fast. 
uh, if you think about how long it takes to scan and then select the right picture and then pick it up potentially and hand it to your caregiver. So often when we teach um, selection-based systems, we're also trying to teach some topography too. So maybe some approximation of speech, things like that. I'm gonna go to the next uh, slide, Rachel. Here we're talking about more alternative methods um, that might include less specific responses. So scanning and touching printed words on a screen or using a small screen, that's an alternative method. Um, exchanging photographs, um, using a picture exchange communication system or a PEX binder. I think, I think folks here might have had more experience with um, picture exchange systems that um, the, the one that's called PEX, which is a, um, a model that's out there and, and used a lot, but you might have a system that is electronically based, something that is used as um, a voice recognition output system. There's all sorts of different um, modes of communication. I think the important thing in relation to um, how we teach communication and how we learn about communication is that the communication system and the training regimen needs to be very individualized uh, for the learner. It needs to also include getting the learner as close as they can to being able to communicate with as many people as they can. Um, and so you might start out with a selection-based system and then move to a partially spoken system, or a, you might teach both and sign. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that I'd like to say about selecting one of these is that um, from the perspective of someone trying to help often establish communica functional communication programming, it's important that you're purposeful in your selection and that um, you don't select five different methods at once. Uh, you consider um, slowly implementing and um, ensuring that learning communication is a process and that um, you also work to train caregivers about how to use the communication system to fluency or until they're very comfortable with it. You wanna to move to the next one, Rachel? Here we have some more examples of um, kind of the other options for alternative methods of communication, and that's typing words, using an electronic screen, um, also typing words with a braille writer, visually scanning or pointing. Um, I think we pretty much covered all of these. I think we're okay. You could also do switches, um, and in some cases, uh, you can do, um, I think you, people need to know that you can do switches, things that are easy for the learner to, to use related to whatever impairment they might have in maybe moving their body or being able to use their voice. Okay, next one. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the functions of communication. So the functions of communication are the, the best way I can describe it at the moment are the things we do to get to get what we need have four basic functions um, number one we say manned in behavior analysis and a manned is the most basic function of communication and it's an example of an early manned might be a baby crying and a caregiver picking the baby up and either giving the baby food or giving the baby love or changing the baby's diaper, which is a request. A man is a request. I need something. And often when we teach mans, it's the very first thing we teach um, when we're working on communication. And it's very basic. It's a request. Um, the next one is attacked. Attacked is a label. As development progresses, um, human beings begin to label things. I mean, if you think about a young child, um, parents, caregivers walking around the house and they touch, they touch a chair and they say chair 
and maybe the child approximates the word chair and says chair, or maybe they say chair. Or if you think about um, you think about toys and balls and things that the child might be able to select and identify. So that would be something the learner sees that they're able to identify, which is a different function than making a request, right? So he could be he could be requesting a ball, and that would be a request for a ball. But he could look at a ball and say ball, and that would be labeling a ball. So there you see two different functions of language of communication. Another function of communication is the ability to follow instructions, receptive communication. So doing what's asked. Um, non, non, it can be non-vocal and often visual, often visual cues can be present when you're making a request, right? So following instructions. And finally, answering questions. So introverbal. And that would be expressive too, expressive language. So responding to a request of someone else and there's no visual cues present. Um, you wanna move to the next one, Rachel? Okay, in relation to the function of communication, let's also discuss vocal imitation. So an echoic is a very early um, step in learning communication and an echoic might be a partial echoic, so they're going to respond and um, copy a piece or a part of what uh, a caregiver is saying to them or uh, a social partner is saying to them um, and imitate it. So I think of, when I think of this, I think of something very basic like Dada very early on when, um, when a parent is looking over the baby and saying something like, daddy loves you, daddy loves you, daddy loves you. And then the baby says, da. And then the parent reinforces that behavior with a giant smile and a huge happy dance. And you have the beginnings of echoics. Um, echoics can be um, pretty interesting in relation to autism. And as we move forward in the presentation, maybe we'll address more of that um, later on as we talk about functional communication assessment and how you teach functional communication. Um, another function of communication is learning to read. So being able to read and then understand text. Um, and in relation to reading, also being able to read and say, communicate what is being written. And finally, another function of communication is writing and transcription. And you might have noticed, um, so that might be writing down the ability to write down and, and what is said. But you might have noticed as we go through, um, we go through all the functions of communication, what we use communication for, you might have noticed that it gets, it gets more and more complex as we move forward. Um, so, but it might be that a given learner may not have um, verbal speech, but may be able to read, may be able to write, may be able to understand um, introverbal, may, be, inter may be, be able to understand. So as we move forward thinking about and talking about communication, I think it's really important to understand that as we as we try to develop communication skills, as we try to grow functional communication, it requires a great deal of assessment and very individualized assessment to figure out where the learner is and what their strengths are and what their vulnerabilities are and build um, functional communication programming related to that. Do um, you wanna move on to the next one or am I? Okay, so here's an example of the different functions for one word. Um, and Rachel picked cookie because cookie's a good word to pick. Like I said earlier, the word ball could be I want the ball or it could be that's a ball, right? So with the word cookie, cookie could be cookie as a request that would make it a mand, a request for the cookie. It could be cookie. They see a picture of the cookie on TV, they see, they see a cookie 
and they're just showing mom or showing caregiver that they see the cookie and they can name the cookie. Um, it might be cookie um, and when asked, what do you want for a snack? And so they're responding to someone else's um, question. That's a different function for the word. It's a response. It's not a man, it's a selection and a response to a question. And then in, in the form of an echoic, uh, you say cookie and the baby says cookie or maybe an approximation of cookie, depending. I'm gonna to move to the next one, Rachel. Challenges to communication. And this, I kind of touched on this at the very beginning. Um, forgive me if I talk too fast. Um, but I think it's really important, the, the first bullet point on this slide, is the learner may not be given opportunities to communicate. And if a learner has some kind of a difference um, or impairment, um, autism um, a communication impairment is, is one of the major features of it, they are given, often given future opportunities of, um, given fewer opportunities to communicate and that obviously that impairs um, learning opportunities but it also impairs social opportunities and the fewer opportunities you have to practice the less likely you are to engage in the behavior and so um, it's very very important that communication is established for the learners it's also I think in 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 my opinion it should be a fundamental right uh, for people to have communication systems that allow them to interact with their environment um, as functionally as possible. Um, communication systems are very important because the learner might understand much more that they can, than they can say, and, and it impairs their ability to have access to any kind of independence. So building um, communication systems can allow much more independence for for learners and for human beings and making sure that the communication system functions well for them and is easy enough for them to use and is understandable by the largest group the largest amount of other people in their environment is very important to independence um, it's important that you can select a system that allows the audience to understand what the learner is saying and I, I cannot tell you um, how important it is uh, that it's simple and it's understandable and learnable I think also by the audience um, particularly by um, social groups and peers too in school uh, often communication systems might develop between a caregiver uh, but dedicated and maybe maybe a caregiver um, develops um, a caregiver transitions and as, as a child grows older a new caregiver comes in or they're in a new school and the the communication system doesn't transition w with the learner and there's a whole new audience and that can impair communication greatly I've seen that happen and so the more, um, the clearer, the more individualized and the more um, exposed caregivers are to understanding the communication system and how to teach others to use the communication system um, is very important because the system needs to generalize and to train the audience how to use it um, and how to transfer it from one audience to another. Very, very important. Um, and different learners, depending on where they are, and, and Rachel will talk more about this when she talks about assessment, may not use words um, across all functions. So in other words, some learners may be able to mand or make requests um, and tact, but they may not be able to answer questions. Um, they may or they may be able to receptively understand questions, but not be able to um, express those questions. So it's important to determine what functions the learner's capable of, of doing 
and what functions are challenging to the learner or need to be um, taught more thoroughly. You want to move to the next one or are we on to you, Rachel? I think we're switching back to me now. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Summer. Thank you, Rachel. So um, actually, before we get started on this, I want to do another poll and um, see what kind of experience you guys have had. So there's currently a question that says, what type of communication systems do you have experience with? And um, I believe you can select more than one that's supposed to be how it's set up. So if you can take a minute and just let us know what kind of communication systems you have had some experience with. Um, for accessibility purposes, I hope that everyone is good with at least receptively understanding what we're saying, so spoken language. Um, and then everything else, if you had some experience with some of those other systems. Great, I see some responses coming in. About half the people have answered, so we'll give it a little bit longer. Um, what we're about to talk about is um, a little bit of the typical development, and then also, um, Summer touched upon it, and, and I'm gonna maybe skip around because now I'm wondering why we didn't have the slide in earlier. Um, so if it comes up later, I apologize for repeating myself. Um, and here we go. You should be able to see the results. Um, some people doing sign language, some people using picture exchange or voice output, and a few people um, using other systems. So thank you guys very much for answering. Um, so when we talk about finding a system that is individualized um, for the learner and meets their needs, we do need to conduct basically an assessment. Um, that could go um, a couple of different ways. There are a few different assessments. I always recommend that people get um, a, a speech path, a speech pathologist involved, as well as any other um, behavior analytic providers that they're working with, because those are two professionals that do work specifically on communication skills. So, um, involving a speech pathologist, um, you can, and specifically involving a speech pathologist who maybe has some experience with alternative forms of communication, if it appears that vocal speech is going to be challenging. Um, there's a couple of things that they can do. Um, they could diagnose things like apraxia or other um, motor issues that would make it physically difficult for a learner to use vocal speech. And if they have experience with alternative communication systems, they can assess and recommend maybe which type of um, alternative communication system would work well for that learner. Um, and then they can also help to uh, work on those skills. And um, as a behavior analyst, I've worked in conjunction with um, speech pathologists before in order to make sure that we are um, addressing things in a developmentally appropriate sequence, which was something that I honestly had not thought about when I first was as a consultant, um, teaching uh, a coex vocal imitation to a three-year-old with autism, we're working on letters and um, we had a speech, or letter sounds, and we had a speech pathologist tell us, well, that's not the right order. Kids learn these in a certain order. You need to teach them in that order. And so kind of, you know, working in conjunction with a speech pathologist um, and a behavior analyst would be great to address both sides of those things, the functions of the communication so that we know we're addressing um, ways for the learner to mand or request for what they need. Um, as Summer said, to reduce the likelihood of problem behavior because they have a way to ask for um, what they need um, should be the initial forms of communication. But also that when we're working on things um, such as vocal speech, that we're approaching it in a developmentally appropriate sequence. Um, so now I just 
pulled out some samples from the CDC's developmental milestones and wanted to go over basically kind of the, the typically developing order of communication. So we talked about a little bit the infant. They cry for what they need, and that would be considered a man. That is the only way that they have to um, communicate to get their needs met is to cry. And as they get older, then we're able to um, shape up some of those other communication forms and other topographies to communicate if the learner is um, typically developing as far as vocal speech goes. So these are typically developing. Um, about six months is when uh, children are able to respond to sounds by making sounds. So the beginnings of those echoics. Um, if someone's saying da 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 da, and the kid says da da, you know, where they're echoing back what was said. Um, and they're also starting to respond to their own name, and that would fall under that receptive category. So following instructions or responding to what someone else is saying. Um, for those of you that have children um, or have uh, babysat or cared for um, small children, uh, you may recognize that sometimes small children, typically developing small children, will be able to follow instructions and go and get things um, much more than they can say. So I might be able to tell my toddler, you know, okay, go get your diaper, and they can go and they can get it and they can bring it to me. But if I were to ask, what is this? They might just be like, da, da, da. They might make some sounds or they might not have any vocal production that they are um, that would reliably be able to label it or answer a question about it. By one year, um, learners are starting to respond to simple spoken requests, um, following some of those instructions like I was just talking about, and they're starting to meaningfully use some uh, simple repetitive um, labels like mama and dada, um, baba for binky or bottle, those kinds of things. So things that are meaningful in their environment that they um, have uh, possibly could ask for as well. Um, they're also able to label those things now. About a year and a half, saying several single words. So they're starting to do some of that vocal speech. And this might be where um, if a learner has a communication delay, this is probably about where there start to be signs that, well, they're not talking as much as their peers. They're not, you know, they're, they might be throwing more tantrums, going back to that crying for what they need because they don't have a good way to request um, what they need. So this might be the part where, you know, parents or caregivers are starting to look into, you know, is there a communication delay? What can we do to support their communication skills? Um, by two years, pointing to things when they're named. So again, that's receptive. If there's a book, oh, where's the cookie? Where's the ball? Where's the hat? And they're finding those things in the book. And two years, uh, they're also starting to repeat words that they've heard. Um, this is also the point where, as a parent, you start, um, oh, wow, I better be careful what I'm saying around my toddler because they're starting to say everything um, that I say, even things that weren't directed at them. Um, so that would be an example of the echoics. By about three years, um, learners are following two or three step instructions, so more receptive. Um, they can name most familiar things, so those are your tags. And they start to say some of their personal information. Um, I point this out because this is where interverbals start. And also at three years, two to three sentence conversation. Um, this is the first point where, for typically developing children, we start expecting them to be able to vocally answer a question when asked without any visuals or anything like that. So what's your name? How old are you? Um, things like that. This is important because when we start talking about teaching communication, we want to make sure that we are teaching the functions of communication in an appropriate order for a developmental sequence. Um, Sometimes we might be really eager if we've uh, if we've taught a learner 
to use a picture system, let's say, or we've just started getting them to speak with words. So that let's let me just create an example. Um, there's a four year old who previously has not been talking and now they're starting to say words. Sometimes we want to rush to getting them to answer questions because other four year olds can answer questions. But if this learner has just now mastered vocal production of speech, which would be more along the lines of a one-year-old, a two-year-old, then we shouldn't be pressing for something that in typical development still took another year of practicing that vocal production of speech. So when we talk about teaching um, communication, we also want to make sure that we're we're going in an appropriate order um, and not jumping too far ahead just because the learner is of an age where we would expect a different response if they were had typical communication development. Also by about three years is where the articulation is clear enough to be understood. So if we picture that, um, this learner has been listening to um, language for three years before they're really able to produce it in a fashion that um, strangers who aren't familiar with them and their articulation can understand. So again, same thing. We don't want to rush our learners who have just started imitating and echoing sounds and press too hard for some of those um, difficult uh, articulation sounds because they need practice at you know, a level where, I mean, when my, when my kid was two, we were like the only ones that understood her. And I've watched videos since then. And I don't understand her looking back. I'm like, I don't know how I understood what you were saying then. But at the time, you know, we did understand. So making sure that we're not pushing our learners too hard, too fast on some of these uh, developmental milestones, they still need practice. And especially thinking that if there's a communication delay, whether that's autism and therefore some other delays um, in other skills or some other form of communication delay, they're going to need even more practice before they're going to be able to be successful. Um, so bear those things in mind. Um, at four years, they're telling stories. Um, at five years, that's when we start doing some of the writing of numbers and turning pages and recognizing some sight words. So things like writing and reading for a typically developing learner um, are five years. Those are, you know, they're down the road. Um, they might be able to label some letters earlier, but they are not necessarily printing or reading until four or five years old. So all of that basically to just say, we don't want to rush our learners. <laughs> and we want to start with MANS, giving them a way to request for what they want. Um, so how do we actually start to teach communication? Um, the first thing, like I said, we want to start with requesting or manding, giving our learner a way to ask for what they want and need can significantly reduce problem behavior. If you attended the first webinar, we talked about functions of behavior and we talked about um, alternative re um, replacement behaviors, appropriate alternative replacement behaviors to teach instead of problem behavior. And most of our examples were teaching a way for the learner to communicate what they needed. So if they were acting out for attention, teaching them a way to appropriately ask or get someone's attention. If they were engaging in problem behavior to get out of a task because it was too difficult or because they needed a break, our replacement behavior would be teaching them to ask for a break, teaching them to ask for help. And so even like the first words that kids have, usually typically developing kids have, are requests. Um, some sort of request for what they want. And as we talked about, newborn babies cry to get their needs met. That is the, the communication form that they use. So we want to start with 
teaching our learners to request for what they want. There's a few things that we can do. Um, for one, it's really fun for the learner to start with this as well in communication training because they're getting what they want. <laughs> and because you've conducted an assessment and met with an SLP or BCBA and, and you've determined what's going to be the best communication system for them if it's not clear that vocal communication, vocal speech would be the best, um, then you're making this easy for them. You're trying to find something that is super easy. Um, if we are working with someone, I'm going to go through a couple of scenarios. If we're working with someone who is working on vocal speech, then we would want to accept any approximation basically towards that sound. So if I hold up, I have my iPad handy. If I hold up my iPad and I'm trying to get the kid to ask for the iPad, depending upon the starting skills of the learner, maybe any vocal sound, I would give them the iPad. Or if we're working, if they have um, a few more skills and we're working on particular sounds, then anything that sounds close to iPad is going to get it. So if they're like, ah, ah, maybe that gets it. Or puh, maybe that gets it. So I'm going to identify what's successful for my learner. Um, if we're using non-vocal communication, so maybe we are pointing, then I might just have any sort of a reach any sort of a point or a gesture towards the iPad would get the item. If we were introducing a picture system, um, then maybe a gesture towards the picture, if it's a, if it's a, like on a card kind of a picture system, or if it's a PEC system, um, picture exchange communication system, um, they, start with one icon there's only one icon it's really big and it's the only thing on the table and all the learner has to do is like touch that and pick it up so we would work on that piece of it to get that exchange make it super easy this learner does not need to say may i have the ipad please um, they just need to make a communication attempt um, and it's fun because then they get the ipad for a little bit um, teaching requesting is also a good idea because they can quickly gain control of their own environment. So using those appropriate skills of vocal requests or pointing or a picture request or whatever other requesting system you're using, they can see that, oh, all I need to do is this very simple task and then I get what I want. And I don't need to hit, I don't need to scream, I don't need to throw myself on the floor. It reduces um, the likelihood that the learner is going to engage in inappropriate behaviors because the only thing that's going on is getting fun things with a very simple, um, easy skill for them to display. Also, because we're using things that they enjoy that are potential reinforcers, like we talked about in the last webinar. Um, it motivates the learner to want to participate and want to learn um, in, the, in that environment because they're doing a, a relatively simple task and getting things that they want from it. So it's a very rewarding environment for the learner at that time. Another reason that we would start with requesting is because that's where our developmentally, typically developing uh, communication learners start is being able to request for what they want. So if we're going to teach those mans and instructions, the first thing we need to identify what those preferred items are that the learner, learner is likely to be motivated by. Um, last week's webinar we talked about reinforcers and we went over a preference assessment, um, a variety actually of ways that you can assess preferences, for what an individual might enjoy. Um, so at this point, I would say that some of those preference assessments were about, well, ask the learner what they want. And given that we're talking about communication, we might not be able to ask our learner and expect to get a reliable response because we're trying to teach them how to ask for what they want. So 
we're probably going to need to go with um, one of the preference assessments that involved um, laying things out and seeing what the learner is interested in or presenting a choice of two items and letting the learner pick one and then having that one available. Um, so you want to determine what items they might be interested in. Um, th then you can work on identifying a way for them to request that. Um, one thing that I have done with uh, early learners when we are starting communication, uh, starting communication skills, which is like the first thing that we do, is um, setting things up in a room, but having everything on a high shelf or in um, clear plastic Tupperware containers that the learner can't open. Um, if your learner is taller, bigger, stronger, those may, um, you may have to modify that kind of arrangement. But if we're talking about um, a smaller, younger learner, then those are really good ways to make things visually available so that they can see what they might be interested in and then set up the opportunity for them to practice that communication skill. Um, so the item's out of reach, but visible. You want to create motivation. If they can just, um, if you just have like five items out on the floor and they can just grab whichever one, then as soon as they show interest in one, if you try and make them communicate for that, even if it is a relatively simple communication skill, if that's a challenge for them, they may just move on to the next item. So you do have to kind of restrict that free access, once you have an idea as to the kinds of things that they like, then put them in containers, put them up on the shelf to set up those opportunities so that the learner does have to ask for something. Um, one thing that can come up as far as challenging uh, with regards to that is once your learner does reach a certain size or age, they might be really motivated to get something and have figured out how to get it on their own. So um, I've definitely worked with, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds who would totally pull up a chair, climb up on the counter, get the cookies out of the cabinet, and help themselves to the cookies. They didn't need to talk to get the cookies. They didn't need to point. They didn't need to ask anybody to get cookies because they could physically get them themselves. In those cases, we might need to, you know, put things in a child-proof locked cabinet or, um hide them in a place where the learner cannot get to them themselves, simply so that we can create those opportunities for requesting if our goal is to, um, to improve the communication skills. Um, errorless teaching. We want to make sure that we're using errorless teaching. So we're using prompts in order to help the child be correct on the first try. Um, We've talked about this, I think, a little bit in, a, in the other ones or alluded to this in the past webinars, but we want to make sure that we're making this as easy as possible for the learner. If we're expecting a, um, a new response that the learner has never displayed before or has very rarely displayed before, it could be very frustrating to just hold out and wait for them to spontaneously do that skill again. Instead, we want to use prompts to help the child to be correct right away. And then we can fade out how much help we're giving them so that they can still be successful. This is what's going to make that learning session or opportunity fun and motivating because it's not going to be too hard that they experience that frustration of not getting it right. So if I were to be working on pointing, I might start by just accepting a reach, and now they're consistently reaching for the item. Great, so I've already got them displaying their hand in an extended fashion. Um, now I might want to work on prompts where I'm just going to touch their fingers. I don't know, how do I do this? So I like to just do this where I just like barely touch their fingers so that you get some of the fingers are bent. It doesn't matter if it's a nice firm point, but we're just working on a little bit more closer towards this pointing. And you can help, or if they'll allow you to hold their hand, you could hold their hand into a point and then let them point for the item that they want and then give it to them. And then you can fade off how much help you're providing, how much you're physically touching them 
um, in order for them to be successful. If we're talking about the vocal production of speech, then this might be the opportunity where you're modeling it iPad, and then they copy it and you give it to them and then you fade out your model in the future. You don't um, give them as much. You might say it quieter or you might just do the mouth movements instead of saying it so that they're still successful, but they're still getting that support necessary um, so that it's not a challenging, frustrating situation. And then the biggest and most important part of teaching a request is that whatever they ask for, that's what you give them. This is now, before you say, well, every time they ask for, I can't give them everything that they want. I understand that. When you're setting this up in a specific situation, then if you're, te if you're holding the iPad so that they can practice saying iPad, then you need to give them the iPad so they can play it. Um, so if you're setting up the situation where you have certain things in bins, then once they engage in that communication response, then you need to give them access to what they said. Um, now, sometimes what happens is that we teach this part very well, and then the learner goes around and they ask for everything, and they expect to have it right away because they said it. And this happens with typically developing kids, too. And this is where we start working on accepting no, because you can't actually have everything just because you asked for it. Um, sometimes with learners um, with an autism diagnosis or other developmental delays, they may uh, experience more problem behavior with accepting no. And, um, and that may be a more challenging situation, um, but that can be taught separately and then those two can sort of be combined. Um, but just once you get to the point that your learner is reliably requesting things, then that's where you do want to start working on, but not always do you get what you want. All right. Um, additional things with teaching mans. You want to start with just a couple of specific requests. So really highly preferred items so that they're going to be very motivated to engage in that communication response. And we want to make sure that they're specific, not more and please. Because nothing is more frustrating both to the provider or caregiver and to the learner than your learner running up to you and saying more, more. And you're like, more what? Or saying, please, and you're like, please what? I don't know what it is you're asking for, but they are very earnestly giving that um, sign or saying that word that they were taught in another situation, which is wonderful that they're generalizing it, but we don't understand them. So stick with some very specific um, requests. Um, Picture exchange is uh, good about making sure that you start with a specific request because there's not really a sign, there's not really a picture for please or more. Um, I mean, there are some, but they're really abstract. Instead, it's like, here's a picture of the iPad. iPad, here's a picture of the ball. Ball. Um, if you're doing signs or if you're doing vocals or any other kind of um, uh, I guess those would be topographies of communication. Um, you want to make sure that you are identifying a way to communicate that is going to be understood by whoever they're going to communicate with. So pointing actually would be a good one because you have to point at what it is that you want. It's whatever my finger touches. Um, now, I definitely have sat with some kids who are pointing and reaching up in a cabinet, and I've lifted them up and like, okay, show me what it is that you want. You know, at least in that case, I can provide assistance to help figure out what it is they want. In the case of a more or a please, I might just have to start bringing in this. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? And that can be frustrating. Um, both for the provider or caregiver and for the learner because they're talking and you're not listening, you're not understanding them. Um, 
we want to set up teaching opportunities. Um, so stage the environment so that the learner has to request for the item. Like I said, put the cookies in a childproof cabinet if that's what you need to do so that they have to ask for them. Um, and um, or putting putting all the toys up on the shelves, putting um, items in plastic containers that they can see into but they can't get into. Those are a, a, a variety of ways that you can set it up. The other thing would be to set things up throughout the day when the learner wants an item. So if it's snack time and you know that your learner always gets a string cheese and a granola bar and some apple juice, um, you know, you have a good idea as to what they want, you can use that as a communication opportunity. As you're bringing the apple juice over, then you can hold it and wait for that point or wait for that card or wait for that vocalization and then provide it or use it as a model. Say, juice, juice, yay, here's your juice. Use those opportunities um, so that they do say, um, ask for things even if you already knew what they wanted and you're already going to give it to them anyway. That's just another opportunity to practice communication. Um, and then over time as they're successful, reduce the amount of help that you're providing. Fade out those prompts that you are using. We want to guarantee that the learner is still able to produce the response, so you don't want to stop helping super quickly that won't work but if you um fade out gradually if you do it a little bit less or if you wait a little bit longer before you give them the hint or the prompt those are good ways to allow them to be successful and yet still guarantee that or allow them the chance to be independent but still guarantee that they are being successful in their communication attempt All right, so fingers crossed, I'm gonna try and show a video here. <laughs> um, this is an example of how you might set up uh, communication requests. Now this one has a couple of things because this was a, a training video that I was using. Um, so that's me in the gray there and my daughter. And um, you can't quite see our faces because bad camera angle, but We'll just bear with it. Um, the idea is that I'm going to hold the items, either setting them on the counter behind me or holding an item, and then getting a response, whether that is eye contact. So eye contact could be a request, whether that's a point, um, or whether that's a vocalization. So fingers crossed, let's see if it works. There you go, good pointing. So I was trying to teach a point response. So I'm moving her hand and trying to curl her fingers good under. pointing. You get the duck. You don't need to do any vocals because what you're trying to get is some sort of request. You can also do it for eye contact. <laughs> good looking. And you can you can hold it in front of your face. Nice looking at me. There you go. As your prompt. That would be a visual. Those are yeah. These are all be visual prompts if they're close to your face. And then. You know, for the words, you can actually just leave them up and model. You can but right now, her vocal limitations also kind of. Yeah, so. Phone. Phone. Good job. Oh, <laughs> 
And so if your learner loses interest, <laughs> you have to move with what they're interested in. All right, it worked, yay. <laughs> um, let me see if I can go to the next slide now. Um, so the idea is that you can set up opportunities to, um, by having things just out of reach, but where they can still see them, and that you can go for a variety of different kinds of communication requests. So the ones that were demonstrated there, um, looking for eye contact, so waiting for the learner to look at me before delivering an item, um, working on a point um, with a one finger point instead of just reaching and grabbing, um, and then also the vocalizations. Um, in this case, our learner was already vocalizing somewhat um, and just working on a, a clearer pronunciation in that case. So providing that model and then when they copy that, um, then you are uh, delivering that item. So she was getting what she wanted. And when she lost interest in the items that were on the table and started wanting to physically interact, so she ran and kind of tackled, then I tickled her, and then I stopped tickling and looked down at her and waited for her to look back up at me, and then tickled some more. So that, those would be examples there. All right, um, let's see. So teaching man's. Um, once they have started, once your learner has started to request things that are visible and that you're kind of like doing the Vanna White thing, they're close by on display, then you want to start increasing the distance between the learner and those items. So put them up higher, put them across the room so that they're having to scan and look and they're not only requesting if someone's holding it right in front of them. That can increase the independence um, of them being able to request for what they want or need. You can also start moving items so that they are out of view, so partially covered or outside in the other room that you just left. And that way they're working on asking for things that they don't have right in front of them. Um, that is harder if your communication request is a point because I can't point for something that's not there. But um, you would want to make sure that if you're working on something like that, you are, you've given them a communication uh, system that allows for them to ask things, ask for things that are not present. Oftentimes what I do um, as far as just early learners who aren't displaying um, much of any uh, communication skills is we work on pointing and we work on a vocal imitation if it's not if they're not already vocalizing things um, so that we can work on vocal speech um, as their vocal imitation increases and I might also work on eye contact and I might work on a picture exchange system just to see what's gonna work best for this learner if I don't already know so that would be an example of um, of a way that you could do a, a communication assessment to determine what is going to be best fit for a learner is start with a couple of different things. Um, however, if I, and, and I say that like generally if I'm doing that many different things, that learner is like two or three and just got a diagnosis and we're starting with, um, with very limited skills in, in all departments, in all areas. So we really have to try a bunch of stuff to see what's gonna work best. Versus another learner who may have had experience with different systems or has a, an established level of like, here's what they can do in these different areas, they've been assessed in a lot of these areas, then we might select which one is gonna work the best for them. Um, 
We can also work on having the learner ask for activities instead of just physical items. Um, so one thing that we did uh, with a learner that I used to work with was we took pictures of the learner engaging in activities that she preferred. So we took a picture of her being tickled by mom. We took a picture of her on the swing. We took a picture of her um, in the swimming pool or you know whatever it is playing ring around the rosy or jumping on the trampoline all of these activity things that she liked but weren't a physical thing that we could hand her we took pictures of her engaging in those and then when she wanted to ask for one of those things she would pull out that picture as her request so it was like a picture exchange system except it was it was physical photographs of what she was of herself doing those activities instead of the icon because icons didn't make any sense to her they didn't they didn't represent anything for her at that time so we took pictures of her engaging in those and then she could look at the pictures find the one of her doing the thing she wanted and give that to mom or dad to ask for the activity um, and then we can also work on, um, and these are kind of growing up in difficulty, asking for attention. So um, using some of those phrases that um, typically developing learners use, excuse me, or watch this, or listen to me, or, you know, look at me, those kinds of um, requests for attention, we can also work on for our learners because they might just want you to physically be there and not necessarily um, need an item, but they're wanting that attention. This would also be where we might start working on asking for um, breaks or asking for not to do something in the future or adding more details to the level of um, the request adjectives. Where is it? What color is it? What kind of things did you want? Best, the specifics. Um, after the first couple of mans or requests are mastered, so if we started with like ball and iPad and car, because those are the three most preferred things that the learner can ask for, then we want to start working on um, new sets. So after we've got a couple of those, now we're going to add on things that might also be highly preferred. Um, or might be slightly less preferred, but still things that the learner's going to want. What we don't want to do is have the first words that we're trying to teach be things that the learner would never choose to do on their own. I don't care if my learner can request homework because they're never going to want to request homework. <laughs> um, but I want them to be able to request things that they do want or need. So foods, drinks, fun things. Um, but broccoli probably isn't a word that they're going to need in their vocabulary very soon. Maybe if they love broccoli, then absolutely put it in there. But you don't need to focus on words that uh, for things that they don't like. You want to go with the motivation. What are things that they like? And then with those initial set of words that you they have mastered as a request, then that's where you want to start working on the different kinds of functions of the communication. So if I know now that my learner can request iPad, now maybe I'm going to start working on it with uh, in the context of receptive so I put out an iPad and let's see what else do I have close by iPad and phone touch iPad so now that is an instruction that I want them to follow I'm not necessarily going to give them the iPad after it because that's not the context that I'm teaching a receptive skill is going to be following instructions so touch the iPad they touch the iPad great listening then if they wanted the iPad then they could go back and they could request it like we had worked on before um, a coex. So if, for example, um, our learner is not very fluent at echoing um, the sound, so they're communicating for the iPad by doing a picture exchange or by pointing, when they hand that picture for the iPad, that's when I might be able to work on iPad 
and having them copy me and echo me. And now I'm working on a COIC. Um, and working on things like tax, so they're just labeling what there is, they're commenting about things that they see without needing to get that item next, and then answering questions um, that they are, um, you know, what is it? <laughs> what is it? iPad, great job. So you want to start with just a couple of mans first and then expand out from there. Okay, so we have another video. Um, this video is actually going to be an example of um, uh, an example of um, receptive labels. Sorry, lost my words there. Receptive labels. So in this case, um, this isn't necessarily um, an item that she wants. Um, there's a picture, one is a picture of a phone and one of them is a picture of the fork. And the fork is the one that we're targeting. We're basically trying to teach a new vocabulary word. Um, and uh, identifying what it is. So this would be an example of how you might teach um, receptive labels. Um, where you are presenting a couple of items. Um, these are pictures out in front of the learner, and then the provider is going to say, touch fork, and she's going to assist the learner to receptively touch the correct picture. And this one's a little bit longer. So receptive select pictures. So I'm going to skip ahead like just a few feet up. So she says, come sit, but she's guiding her over there because she doesn't follow that instruction yet. Touch fork. There's the fork. Good job. Touch fork. Fork. That's the fork. Don't hesitate on your prompts. No. Either decide to prompt or decide to wait. And if you wait, then say it again when you prompt. So there she's asking for it, but she's not calling it a fork. She's calling it like bread or something. She's still Don't physically the helping her to touch the fork. Fork. Fork, that's the word, you're right, fork. Touch fork. That's the fork. Touch fork. Fork. Do you have a reinforcer? <laughs> Because she's losing interest. <laughs> They're behind you. So in this case, because this isn't, she doesn't care about the fork, you have to have that additional reinforcer in order to keep the learner motivated. So on both. <laughs> So there the learner reached for what she wanted instead of like saying something in particular, but that was an okay response. So she's prompting her, but then she's now delivering a reinforcer after the learner touches the correct. So now we should see a little bit of improvement where the learner is maybe paying attention a little bit more because now there's some motivator, there's a reinforcer available. Still 
prompting it. Nice work. Now your learner just slaps the fork, but there was no instruction. So, you know, we're working on her following the instruction. So prompt it again. And there. Our learner finally followed the instruction to touch the fork. So that would be an example of how you might introduce receptive labels for something that, um, at least in that situation, a fork is not something that she needs. But maybe a fork is something that she needs and would request when she's eating spaghetti or eating something else that needs a fork that I can't think of right now. Um, <laughs> and so that would be a way to start branching out and working on a different uh, function of communication. So in general, um, to teach communication, you wanna make sure that there's consistency. Um, consistency involves multiple opportunities to practice. So you're not just practicing only under one condition with one person. Um, you might need to start there, and that's okay. Uh, but ideally, you are involving multiple people, going different places, setting up different scenarios, um, so that your learner has lots of opportunities to practice their communication skills. Um, I definitely have seen learners who were very, very good at requesting for food items at snack time, but couldn't ask for anything else any other time of the day. And we don't want to get into a spot where that's the only thing that our learner can ask for is only under certain conditions. Um, we want to set up communication opportunities throughout the day for a variety of different kinds of things, not just what you want to eat at snack time. Um, we also want to work on gradually fading that support out. And if there are multiple people working on this skill with the learner, then you wanna make sure that everybody is using the same strategy. Either we're all waiting a little bit longer or we're all providing a little bit less physical help or a little bit less of a model so that the learner is seeing consistently that, um, that they have to um, display more of the behavior. Um, we also want to make sure that we're setting, enough, setting aside enough time for the learner to practice. We're creating enough opportunities throughout the day, and we might also want to sit there and, um, and, and practice it within a session. You know, one reason that I think some of our learners master their communication skills at snack time is because it is motivating and you can give it in little bitty pieces. If I ask for a pretzel and I get one pretzel, I have to ask 20 times before I might be full of pretzels and not want any more snack. So there are, you're, you're allowing enough time within that situation for them to practice that exchange. So you're only giving them a little bit. Um, when we talked about reinforcement in last week's uh, webinar, we talked about um, being aware of the size of your reinforcer. Um, if you're working on a mand and your reinforcer is going to be the thing that they're requesting, you want to deliver it in a small size so that they have an opportunity to request again. If I only have to ask one time and I get a full meal, then I'm not really getting a lot of opportunities to work on requesting those kinds of um, food or uh, the kinds of food that I'm asking for there. But if every time I ask, I only get a couple of bites, then I get a lot of opportunities to practice requesting. Um, and then additional supports. So specifically, um, depending upon what your, uh, what your role is, if you're a caregiver or a provider, um, 
or not, uh, or, or a case manager or something like that where you're um, not necessarily already fluent with um, a variety of ways to teach communication, you definitely want to seek out additional supports. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a speech language pathologist with um, communication in alternative, uh, let's see, augmented and alternative communication um, strategies, or a licensed behavior analyst. Actually, I would say and might be good with uh, training in functional communication um, so that you're getting uh, a lot of professional support for the best way for your learner to make progress. And actually, that is the end. So we are a little bit ahead of time, and I'd like to open this up to questions. Um, so Summer and I are happy to answer any questions that you have, and um, you can type those questions into the chat bar. Um, and I'm also going to put out here our um, link for our survey. So if you could please click on that link and provide us with feedback on this webinar. I think there's a total of four questions. Um, but we're happy to answer any of your questions now. Um, and if you would like a copy of the slides, or have any additional questions, you can contact me. My email address is rachel, R-A-C-H-E-L, at alaskachd.org. Um, or my phone number at the office is 907-264-6239. So what kind of questions do you guys have? We have plenty of time for questions, so ask us anything. <laughs> Summer, did you have any questions or comments that you wanted to add while we wait for people to uh, type in theirs? I don't, thank you for asking, Rachel, I don't. Uh, I, I think that was a really good overview an introduction. So if anybody's got questions, we're right here. Yeah. We want to make sure, you know, the, the goal of this is that it gives you a, a general idea as to where to head um, or what resources to look for um, to support your communication improvement, um, communication training uh, process. Um, and to help give you a few uh, strategies if you're already working on some of those communication skills. Um, uh, but yeah, there's it, it, we want, for each learner, it's gonna have to be individualized and um, it's going to need to meet their needs. Um, all right, so I see a question. Are either of you familiar with LAMP? We use it for a child with Down syndrome and autism. Um, Summer, you want to answer first? Have you used LAMP before? Oh, you're still muted. There we go. I have not. I have not used LAMP. Okay. Um, I have indirectly, we'll say, I've been exposed to LAMP. Um, I have uh, had a learner that they were considering using LAMP. Um, but we ended up with uh, with sticking with vocal because the concerns were not that he couldn't request um, what he wanted. It was more along the lines of when he was upset, they were trying to find ways to help him problem solve and calm down um, when he was already upset. And we felt that that it was it was a team decision parents in the school and and in home we decided that that teaching a new system that would only be used when he's already upset would not really meet his needs and was not something that would generalize across environments as well um so instead we worked on some very specific um vocal responses and had some visual cues for him um but i do have a learner right now that 
um, that we are, he's currently using PEX, but the SLP has actually recommended that LAMP may be better for him. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be learning more about LAMP. Most of my experience has been with, um, with PEX, though. Um, apraxia, okay, uses eight to 10 icons. Um, PEX might be better. So, um, I don't know. Like I said, my experience with LAMP has not been very much. Um, PEX, I like PEX because it involves that exchange piece um, where you're bringing it to someone and you need to recruit their attention in some way, whether it's just shoving the picture in their hand or their face or whatever, but you're, you're seeking out another person to communicate. So it has a little bit more of that um, back and forth. Um, LAMP, my understanding is that it's more of the, um, the place card kind of a thing, or, or there's a book, and you go through the menus or the colors, and it's more of a pattern. Um, so having not seen that successful yet with a learner, I couldn't say whether or not, but one thing that you'd want to look for is are they able to initiate or do they need someone to kind of start with them in order for them to initiate communication? So that might be something to consider. Um, when you're looking at communication systems, you want to make sure that your learner has a way to initiate because you should be teaching requests first. And therefore, they need that's going to be controlled by what they want and need. And we're not necessarily going to know what they want or need. So we need them to seek us out when they want or need something. Um, it would be worth consulting with, um, I don't know if you're, um, if you're an SLP or, or if you work with an SLP or if the child works with an SLP um, or someone else to come in and, and do a, an assessment or evaluation to see if there's another system that might be better since um, their use, that child's use of the system is kind of limited at this point, despite being exposed to it for a while. Um, I have used PEX with a learner who had apraxia, um, and we were able to improve articulation. Um, she could definitely say things, um, but it was harder for her. But with PEX, she was better able to get her needs met. So, um, but again, I, I most of my AAC experience has been with PEX um, or with the electronic version of PEX. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Maybe other, um, there were a couple of people that marked that they've used uh, other types of um, communication systems. Are there any other types of communication systems that you guys have used or um, ways that your learners communicate? And I'm gonna put the link back in the chat again so that you guys can fill out that quick um, satisfaction survey as well. What about you, Summer? Have you worked with a couple of different uh, learners with a couple of different strategies of communicating? I have. Um, I would say the, the thing that I come across most often, um, because I work with older learners, um, is that there'll be several communication systems in place. Um, so something like a Dynavox in one environment and maybe um, some, some topographical sign language in another environment and um, selection based like PEX in another environment. And I, do, I did see some um, some behavior um, coming up as a result of that. Um, and, and strangely enough, um, most interesting was the caregiver behavior because I would see caregivers in, in the, that setting um, change, <laughs> change tactics very quickly to try to engage the learner. And um, the learner uh, had some apraxia and um, would sort of 
scroll through the options until they finally could communicate. And so um, in, my, in my limited experience, uh, less is better and everybody using the same thing is better. Uh, I also would say I've had some experience with um, electronic medium, such as the Dynavox or the iPad, where, um, where I wondered if the field of choices was not further than what the learner was able to utilize. And I think that that was very, um, is very important um, something about what you said, Rachel, that is perhaps the most important thing, is that you should be uh, creating a communication system and training the learner and be aware of where they are, what they've acquired and what they haven't acquired, um, and be realistic and be very incremental in introduction of new communication um, um, new communication expectations and new communication systems based on that because it can be really confusing uh, and I really think it's super important that if there's more than one specialist working with the child that everybody's on the same page related to that uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there in the community uh, for folks to access it's it's overwhelming um, you know all of the poten potential curriculums are overwhelming and I, I'm sure it's overwhelming for parents to try to make a, a choice so I think um, I think that the best circumstances I've been involved with there's really been a closely connected team communicating related to that selection and then the training um, of, the, of the learner and of the team for using the communication system thanks for asking yeah excellent points yeah um, I think you brought up an, a good point about the vocabulary. Basically, if you're talking about something that has, we'll use a picture exchange system where there's a notebook and there's a bunch of icons. Um, realistically, you should or or you should think of that book as the learner's vocabulary. So as they learn more things, you can add more things to the book. But having a whole lot of things that they've never been exposed to or that they've not been taught um, can be challenging because now there's this giant book with a whole lot of stuff that I have to sort through when really maybe I'm only using eight to ten of those icons then you know have eight to ten of those icons and then systematically increase after they've been introduced um, the other thing that kind of comes up with like viewing those uh, where you have to scan and select systems is that you have to think of it then that if the learner doesn't have their book or for LAMP if they don't have their mat or whatever it is like then they can't talk you've taken away their their speech and how are they going to get their needs met if you've taken their voice from them um, so one of the, uh, speaking specifically with regards to PEX training, um, basically the second step of, of training, the first one is exchanging one icon, the second step is going and getting your book and bringing your book with you and going and finding your book and finding the person and doing that back and forth so that you, the learner, values that book and learns to take that book with them. Um, it's not the sentence strip, it's not vocalizing, it's not more and more icons, it's have that book with you because um, if, if your learner doesn't have that book with them and that's their vocabulary, then they can't, you know, they can't answer questions, they can't ask for what they want, um, they can't communicate outside of when someone else gives them their book and says, now talk to me. Um, same kind of thing goes with if you do have someone there and you're uh, with, a, with a book full of icons or whatever, and you're like, oh, we're all out of chips. I'm going to take the chips icon out so that they can't ask for it. Believe me, if there was a way to have gotten my two-year-old to not ask for things that were not available, I would have done it but that's not how it works like the the learner still has their voice and we need to work on accepting no 
accepting alternatives. Maybe we can have a visual. I've definitely seen people that'll do with like dry erase marker, that'll put an X over it when it's unavailable. Um, after it's asked for, they'll like mark it out like, oh, this one's not available. But the learner should be free to ask for it, um, even if it's not there. Um, because that is their voice and we want our learners to have their voice and have the option to use their voice even if the answer might be no. We ask for things and our answer is no and that's okay. So great point. It made me think of the vocabulary aspect of it. Um, any other questions or thoughts or comments? Well, I think that we are done. Um, that link is in the chat window. So if you would please take a minute to just fill out a four question survey on how we did, what topics you'd like to see in the future, we'd really appreciate the feedback. Um, if you have any additional questions that maybe you didn't want to ask, um, here you can email me, rachel at alaskachd.org. If you'd like the handouts, you can also email me at that email address, rachel at alaskachd.org, and I'll be happy to email those to you. Um, I'll be on my computer here for a few more minutes, so I might be able to get them to you right away. And uh, we thank you very much for attending. Um, please join us next week for our last one. We'll be on visual supports. Um, same time, um, what is that? Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, and it will be Summer and I again. So we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much for attending. I'm going to leave this screen on and I'm going to post the link in chat one more time in case you haven't seen it. Um, so please take a moment to do that and I'll leave my contact information up for a few minutes. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy your weekend.